Hello! Today I want to be talking about five compositional tips to use when in the field to get some different style of images and, and just better images in general. And these five things I use when I'm out and about, and I have mentioned them a few times in my in the field on the lo on location vlogs, but at the time it's difficult to sort of explain them in a more in-depth way. Uh, I usually just reference them in passing, so I thought I'd dive deep while I'm at home and just look at these five different techniques and example images where I've put the idea to use. Before we get into it, I just wanted to say, sorry it's a bit late this week. Uh, there was a problem with the iPad. Um, I was trying something new. I wanted to do some screen recording on the iPad, which uh, I hope I've rectified the issue now. Uh, basically, uh, with the example images, I'm going to put them up, bring them up on the iPad, and I want to show you what they look like. <laughs> and uh, that, this way I can actually draw on the pictures with the iPad and show you the compositional technique in use a much better and much easier than drawing overlays on the computer. That was the idea, but I had a bit of problems with the iPad screen recording, and I ended up recording this first bit four times, and only once did it work out, and then when I moved on to the second bit, it stopped recording again, and I just got fed up and had to take a break. So, it appears to be working. I'm sorry if I get a bit paranoid about the screen recording, I'm gonna be checking that quite frequently. Let's dive in with tip number one is Texture. Texture is a wonderful thing that can be seen in the landscape. It's one of my favorite things to look for when I'm out and about when I'm out and about. And you can find texture in lots of different scenarios and you can use it in different ways as well. The first way you can use texture is with color photography, and that is where you you find a subject that has a lot of contrasting colors and you photograph them in a way that the color is and the patterns within the subject create a nice image and that's with this case here it's an, a nice bracken shot and i really like the varying colors you've got a bit of yellow like this you've got the greens coming through here like this and the mottling with the brown in the background around here i just really like the various different colors a nice pattern and a nice mosaic of color that create a nice composition, in my opinion. So another way that texture can be used to create an interesting image is if you convert it to black and white. So we've got this one. This image is of a, of a rock or a boulder, whatever you want to call it, on the beach. And I just really love these flowing shapes in the, the contrasting texture of the stone. The fact that there's this lovely dark area, these lighter patches, just create a really nice texture and contrast to an image. And again, it's something that I try and look for when I'm out and about. You can also find this sort of texture in the forest. And another black and white image is this lovely one here of some branches hanging over a lock. And I really like the, the clear, clean background of the, that's reflected clouds and then this wonderful pattern and intermingling of the branches that create a very strong texture and contrast and it makes for a nice abstract detailed image. And then this one of a forest is a wonderful example of using the for like the lack of fog and a lack of a defining subject to create a nice image. I just love this pattern of the trees, all these varying branches, but they're, they're still in a nice uniform almost way with these lines just going through the forest and it's very chaotic but I just like the way that that works as a different style of image. And then the last one is using texture as a foreground. Instead of making the image about the texture, you use the texture as a defining as an element in your composition. So this image was um, taken on one of my vlogs. I'll put a card up to that vlog. It's been the most popular video of mine on YouTube and it was a, a sunset shoot at the beach. And I really, really liked this texture of the sand. There's, there was an, an outgoing tide and it created these wonderful ripples in the sand that you can see here, this wonderful texture here. 
as a foreground element is brilliant. This image would work even more if there was something like a lighthouse back here or a castle or something like that to really have these this texture as a, as a strong element leading to an object in the background. That's my only criticism of this image, to be fair. If I had thought about it in the field, I could have actually just done another textural image where I focused on that pattern of the sand, but I didn't. So that's my first tip. It's about the texture you can find in the landscape, and I like to use that to create images in themselves but you can also use it as an element to your composition. The next one we're gonna be talking about is negative space. Now negative space, as the name suggests, is isolating a single subject by having nothing around it. And it, there's these, I've got some great examples here of where negative space can be a real asset for the composition. So for this, the first one, it's got this, this wonderful little beach hut here in the middle, really stands out against this blue sky. So when I arrived on location, I chose this beach hut as my subject. There was other ones around it, so just out of this way there's another one, and just over this way there's another beach hut. But I decided to just select the one and put it bang in the center of my frame, and then create negative space around my subject by stepping back until the just edging out the the beach huts over here on either side and that way i get a nice clean subject we know that the beach hut is the subject and the th fact that the clouds are blue it adds a nice contrast in that negative space let's move on to the next example image this is actually from the same beach it's just a different subject that i saw on the beach i saw this um I don't know what they're called the these old wooden boards where that are used to stop the beach eroding stop the the pebbles being swept away. And I've, I really like this little cross sign that's here at the end of it. And I like the fact that there's this sort of leading line as well, which is coming up in a minute, um, with this uh, fencing and the sea and then the color in the sky, this wonderful color in the sky here. And I like the sea motion as well. So my I, my intention with this composition was is obviously to photograph this as subject. And I tried it at different angles, but this one was my favorite getting the subject again central and getting a lot of negative space around it. And I just like the way that that looked. Now you can also use negative space, much like in the way you can use texture. You can make the image about the lack of a subject. You can make it about the what is not there as much as what it sh what could be there. So this image, for example, that I took in one of my um, in one of my other vlogs. I purposefully created this image without any subject whatsoever and it's all about that negative space. I didn't even notice that you can see this land here. I didn't even notice that was there until in the editing process. But I wanted to capture this colour and so I didn't want anything in the frame distracting from that colour. And the same with the sea. This sea here, I really liked the colour and the definition in the sea. So if you had, could imagine, I don't know, a big hut here blocking out that all of that texture and light like that, or if there were, was a lighthouse over here just beaking out, yes, it would have given another element to the image like that, but I think it would have distracted from that color. And I was going for this wonderful minimal negative space image. Another example where you can use negative space to create an image is this one. Again, this is very simple, but it, it just speaks about the sea to me. And that's the point of this negative space image. I purposefully chose an in them to compose this without any rocks in the foreground like that. If you imagine a rock just sitting in the foreground, it would just look a bit less impactful, I think. I wanted this image to be about the sea, the sky, and these clouds here. It's just, this is the view sailors have. They don't have random pieces of land and stuff. They're often at times at sea without anything. And I wanted this to be an expression of the sea. So I'm using this composition idea of negative space to create an image 
about negative space. And then lastly, this image, the negative space is sort of what made the image. This was taken at Loch Morlick. Normally there is a mountain um, like this going up in the background, oftentimes not a lot going on. And it looks something like that and you can get it nicely reflected in the bottom like that. And that's a great image, I've got that one too. But what made this composition stand out to me on this particular day was the lack of all of that. This low cloud coming in and here like that, just really liked the way that that looked and just framed this wonderful little forest with a nice reflection like that. And even this little band across, it just created an, a very minimalist style of image. And that's the benefit of negative space. You're excluding random objects, you're excluding distractions from the image, and you can really focus in on one subject or the lack of a clearly defined subject to create something a little bit different. So as I mentioned a couple of photos ago, we're gonna be looking at leading lines now. Leading lines are a great asset to an image. They can, If you can find a way of utilizing the line to lead you to your, your definitive subject like a castle or, or some other structure or a mountain, whatever it is, something that is your principal subject in the image, your focal point, you, and you can find something that leads to it in either a snaking S or, or a straight line or whatever, they can make really impactful images. But you can also use leading lines to be the image in itself. The leading line leads you to nowhere. It leads you into the image and makes you wonder what is at the other end. It adds a bit of mystery. So for this image, I got this in a wonderful woodlands, and you can see there is this very prominent leading line leading into the vanishing space at the back of the frame. And it is reflected in this channel in the sky as well, like that. And they both lead you to a point that you can't see. It just appears to go on forever and ever. And I really like that in this image. This is another one where, again, there is these two leading lines. The first one is this fence here, and it leads you to this hut. So that acts as a subject. But then the second one just leads you out of frame. Just leads you to the mountains and then off. And you're left to wonder where does it lead? Does it lead up to the mountains or does it, uh, does it lead somewhere else? And I really like this image and it's actually, in, it, I put this in my landscape calendar last year. This next image was one of my best performing images on Instagram and it, <laughs> I, I, it, it had a square crop, that was the only difference, but I think the thing that really sets people off and what made people like it is the mystery that's involved in it. So I took this on a wonderful misty morning, there was a lot of fog around, and there was also a really nice golden light illuminating the fog. There's this element here of the trees, and I like that as an anchor point. It cent centers you, in the photo, you're standing next to these trees and you're obviously walking this path here. And the path just wanders off into the vanishing point and into fog. And I think that this area here where the path leads and that mystery involved with this path is what made this a very popular image. And it's the same in this one here. It's the same forest, different day. But again, a nice little winding path makes you think of fairy tales, leading you deeper into the forest, around the winding trees, and it, it just le lets your imagination run wild and makes you think, what is after at the end of the path? And then this last image of leading lines is an example where the motion of the, of the leading line leads you to a subject. And in this case, it is a subject that's actually quite hidden and deep in the frame. So obviously we've got this bridge here and the banks of the river. And there's the leading line of the river that leads you to the background. And in the background is this wonderful little hut hidden away just at the back. And that's what this image does. It sort of leads you to that subject of the hut. 
but I like the fact that it's, it's sort of hard to see it, and it means that you have to really look to notice that. Again, building on this idea of mystery using leading lines. The next one is diagonals, and it's, a simil it's the same idea as leading lines, but where the leading line can be anything. It can be a snaking path, it can be a river, it can be anything like that. Diagonals is, is another idea that we can look for when we're examining a landscape and is a little bit clearer for our eyes to see than this conceptual leading line. If you think that diagonals and leading lines should be the same thing, comment below and let me know. And I hope you're, you're getting some ideas from this for when you are able to go out and get your own landscape shots again. So let's dive in at this image from Bow Fiddle Rock. Diagonals feature quite heavily in this image and I think they make a really nice composition and they are definitely acting as leading lines. You can see right here, the main subject is of course Bow Fiddle Rock back there. And then we've got this diagonal, this diagonal, and actually even these contrasting pyramidal shapes there are diagonal, aren't they? These diagonal lines are leading to the subject and they're quite obvious to our eye, a little bit less so than say a path or something like that. This next one I took many years ago, and again, is very strong diagonals, and they're actually leading you to the sunset, to the, the colors in the sky. So if we take a look at this image, there is obviously the strong element of the river. There's the mountains, and then there's this wonderful color in the sky here. So we've got this element here, this diagonal cutting through the frame, this diagonal cutting through the frame, this diagonal cutting through the frame, and this one here. They're all coming at from different directions, but what they are all doing is sort of making your eye circle around the image. So let's say we start here. We follow that line and it leads to us here, and then we go this way and it leads to there, and then we go that way and it leads us back to here. Something like that is how my eye follows this scene. Or let's say we actually start here in the lighter part. You've got this little V frame of the mountains and then they, they flow out with the river. Not, you know, it's just a, an idea. Here this image came from one of my location scoutings on the west coast. Diagonals in this image are leading to this mountain in the background. And that's this one, this one, this one, and this one. It's creating a nice little funnel effect that draws the eye to the background and to the clouds. Here, these clouds and this lovely little mountain. And remember I said that diagonals can act as leading lines, and that's what's happening in this image again. It, again, I tried to position the camera so that the, the, the diagonals led to the sun. And it, the, the one principal diagonal in this image is this one here that's heading across the beach to the sun. And then this one actually, the horizon actually really helps reinforce that as a big arrow pointing to the sun. So if I had positioned this sun in the center of the frame with the direct line, that would have been interesting as well. But I think the diagonal cutting through the frame like that creates a much more impactful image. And then this last one, again, it's all about positioning the camera so that whatever you can see in the landscape creates this diagonal line. And in this case, this was taken soon after I first moved to Scotland, actually. Um, there's several sort of diagonal lines and they're leading to this lighter patch in the background of the, of the image. And there's this one here, this lovely little ridge back, and then these ones as well, acting as lovely little diagonals leading to that brighter spot in the image. And it just gives your, an, your eye a direction to examine this image. You sort of either start in the, the light patch and then look around following those lines outwards, or you start here and follow them that way. So diagonals can be a great way for you to a great thing to keep an eye out for when you're composing images. They are ever present. Any sort of straight edge in your environment can create a lovely diagonal line if you position yourself well. You Essentially, if you consider this is your view, you want to create a sort of diagonal line to your subject, however you can do that. And it's all about how you position yourself 
in relation to the objects in your scene. And the last one is the m one that I use most, and that's because, let me just grab my camera. So I, this last one is the one that you will have heard about a million times, and it is, of course, the rule of thirds. And it's one of the composition techniques that I use the most when in the field, because on the back of my camera, yeah, I'll show you in a bit of B-roll, that's not working. On the back of my camera, there is a grid of the rule of thirds and that makes it really easy to line up subjects when I'm in the field and I can line up objects into those intersections of um, the rule of thirds to create a more compelling composition than if I just had them central in the, the frame like that. It just makes it very static. So when you've got time in the field to switch on to that back of view camera and really compose well Having that grid overlay on your the back of your screen can really help you compose better. On some camera models, you can even have like diagonal lines coming in from the corners like this into the center of the frame like that. And that, can, that would be really useful. My camera doesn't do that, unfortunately. So I just stick with the rule of thirds. But let's dive into these example images where I've actually used that grid to help me compose the image in the field. So this is our first one. I took this in um, when I was down at Fort William having an explore down this valley here. One of the principal subjects in this image is of course this old boat here. When I was composing this image I sort of knew that I wanted this subject to be on one of the intersections in my rule of thirds. And if we have a look at this grid overlay you can see that I positioned the boat exactly on that rule of thirds intersection. And I think that made a nice compelling image. Now, if the boat was over in the center of the image like this, I think it would just be a bit more, a bit less compelling than with it over on that intersection. But that is of course my own opinion. You can also use this in the woodlands. So for example, in this image, a lovely autumn, autumnal forest that I got this image. So I knew that I wanted this tree here to be in focus. That was going to be my principal subject, this tree, and I wanted this background to be out of focus. So I decided to line up this tree on my rule of thirds grid. And if we, if I zoom, go to this, this image with the overlay, you can see how I positioned it just to the side of the intersection like this. And this lighter patch also falls onto that other top intersection here. Next up is a wonderful little shot of Alvey Church, if you want to have a look at that. Now, I think this was taken on the same morning as that because the fog was some of the best fog I've ever had in Scotland. So I just rushed to this location because I thought it would make a nice image as well. And I, I'm not disappointed. So obviously the church was the principal subject in this image. If the church was central like this, I think it would be a little bit less compelling than it being over here on the rule of thirds intersection. And that, that way you've got all this negative space again around the image where there's nothing really competing so that the, the church really stands out. And if we take a look at this, there you go. The, in fact, the bell tower falls directly onto that intersection, which is quite funny. But, you know, there is the other compositional tip of the golden ratio. Now, the golden ratio is quite a complicated thing to visualize. The rule of thirds is a lot simpler and you get quite similar results. So actually, this image here is a great example where the rule of thirds actually helps the golden ratio. Because if we Im imagine a Fibonacci style spiral like that, it sort of leads to the church. My top tip for the rule of thirds is not to position your subject directly on this intersection here like this. Instead, aim for this area around your rule of thirds. Anywhere in this sort of square like that, you will get a nice composition. It doesn't have to be directly on the cross section at all. Soon after I first moved to Scotland and uh, I went to visit this wonderful lighthouse at Rattray Head, which um, I'm probably pronouncing wrong. So obviously the lighthouse was my principal 
subject. You can see that here in this image. And I decided to use the rule of thirds, not only to position the lighthouse, but also to position the foreground elements and the middle ground elements as well. The grass was going to act as my foreground anchor and interest in this image. I really liked the shifting motion of the grass. So we've got this here acting as one third of the image. And then we've also got this area of the sea acting as another third of the image with the sky being the third third. And then if we draw the vertical lines in, you can see I sort of positioned the lighthouse to be at an intersection. So if we check that on with our grid overlay, from what I was saying before, I position, I don't position, I try not to position directly onto that intersection because I, I feel it's too direct, it's too um, forced. Instead, I try and just position it a little bit around it. So if we put in our little square, you can see that the, the lighthouse falls right directly into that sort of intersection. And again, if we had a, like a Fibonacci spiral coming out, it would fall quite nicely into place. And then the last one, I didn't actually position the subject onto the grid. Instead, I, I positioned my horizon directly in the middle of the frame, cutting across, and I sort of, I knew I wanted my subject to not be dead center, but leaning towards one of the, the third lines. And I decided to position the, it, the sun and the subject near to one of those third lines. So if we take a look at this image, this is actually one of my favorite images I've ever captured. It was one of the most impeccable sunsets I've ever seen and it's of the castle stalker on the west coast. So we've got in this image we've got negative space like this. All this negative space around the subject of the castle. We've even got a diagonal leading into the subject like that and we've got this wonderful bright patch here in the the sunset and I just really like the way that those elements came together in this composition. And if we have a look at our rule of thirds grid overlay, you can see that I didn't position any of the elements on the intersections, but what I, I knew that if the castle was dead center, it would just be too obvious. And then there's the sun over here blasting out rays. It would just look too simplistic of a composition. So instead, so using that grid on the back of my camera, I positioned the castle just off of center towards one of those thirds, but not directly in the intersection because I wanted this horizon coming through the middle of the image as well because the sky was fantastic. I mean, look at that sky. And I really like this foreground as well of the, the sea that had smoothed out wonderfully and these diagonal lines. So if I had positioned myself with that castle dead center, I wouldn't have got this composition and I think I would have gotten a worse image for it. So I'm gonna end it there. That was a bit of a whirlwind going through those five ideas of in the field composition tips. And I know that some of those images are not the best ones out there, um, but I, would, I just wanted to show you how the ideas can be applied. Um, not everyone is going to be having these amazing Faroe Islands or Iceland pictures that you see on some professional photographer channels. You know, you, you don't have access to those wonderful subjects. So I, I wanted to really bring it down to earth and show you how you could use those ideas with subjects that you might have around you where you are now. And something, you know, those are compelling images in my book. I think they make quite nice images. I would love to know how, what you think about the various examples. And if you think I, I need to go into a bit more depth about these composition tips, then please comment below. And I'll certainly try and introduce like a, a maybe a, do a little video series where I really dive deep into one compositional idea which I think would be make a good video series as well. I hope you've learned something from this. I hope you feel inspired and I hope you will be looking out for those ideas when you are out doing landscape photography. If you've liked today, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you wanna see what's coming up next, hit that subscribe button down below. It is really greatly appreciated. In the meantime, thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one.